What does secret church mean? Where does this come from? What is the origin of this? The idea is this, that all around the world there is persecution. And there are churches that do not have the freedom to meet in the open. And so when they get together, here it is, listen to this, they have to make the most of the time. In fact, I have friends tonight in Algeria that they get a word, they get a text, they get a, they get a, a phone call that tells them where to go, and they meet together, and they may not meet together again for three or four weeks, simply because the leaders are limited, and the places are limited, and they cannot draw attention to themselves, lest they be greatly persecuted within the cities where they live in southern, what is the southern inhabited region of Algeria. And so when the persecuted church gets together, they go at it very hard, very often. They really study. Now, originally, when Secret Church was initiated by David Platt, this, this program of doing this to, for us to become more aware of the Secret Church around the world, they would get together on a Friday night, and they would start at about 6.30 or 7 o'clock, and they wouldn't finish till 1.30 in the morning. And so you would have the whole notebook and the whole teaching, and they would go as fast as they can all the way past midnight. And they would stop, and they would pray some, and then they would do more teaching. And then they would pray some, and then they would do more teaching. And they would do um, praise and worship very often in the midst of that. That is exactly what we do overseas. When we are working with the persecuted church, because our time is limited, and because we have such a wonderful and comprehensive message to share, we have to move very quickly. And so we sit down. We, don't, we can't just take our time very often to, to just consider every single nuance and option. We have to di dive deep and strong as we go. So what we want to do as a church is kind of remember what it's like for them in the, in the evening, evenings like this. And we want to study very hard and fast what it is like. I want you to imagine that you are somewhere in a warehouse, that you are somewhere um, in, a, in a remote area of town, maybe out in an industrial area where you can meet quietly in a small group and have a time of teaching. That very often is what would be the case. Notice we've talked about this map before. Many of you have said, wow, Mexico is considered um, a high persecution area. If you only knew the number of believers that have been even killed in Mexico, um, not, not just through the drug cartels, but also through other oppressive regimes and oppressive groups, it's been, it's been rather intense. But also notice across North Africa and across the Middle East, and over into what we call Central Asia and then far into Asia. Um, tremendous persecution going on around the world, even tonight. There have been images of persecution that, that have been shuddering to us, that have made us shudder over the last three years, four years. Since ISIS took over and began to go through the Levant region and begin to really um, uh, round up Christians in Egypt and in Syria. Um, and there has been a, a tremendous upsurge of religious persecution from Islamic fundamentalism. But it's not only Islamic fundamentalism. It can be the, excuse me, the Indian government. Did you know that the, gov the great land of India, um, which is now considered orange, extreme persecution, as you see there, the dark orange, and that is because the new president of India has, has brought tremendous pressure upon anything that is not Buddhist. Even the Muslims are being persecuted right now in India, and that's a bit of a change. Used to it was only the Christians that would be persecuted. In fact, they had a fair amount of freedom. But with a regime change um, and a, a very, very um, extreme, extreme view of Buddhism, um, there has been tremendous crackdown on the millions upon millions of Christians, even in India. And we've said that China has also seen a great uptick just in the last two months. I want you to see an encouraging video for just a moment. Alex has a video queued up that's an image from a few years ago, but the, the only reason I'm sharing this with you tonight is because I know people on the ground in Egypt that know some of these families. 
CBN, the one of the one of the uh, Christian Broadcast Network um, reporters, um, was in Egypt and captured some of the story. It's a valid story. Um, some of these would be e uh, uh, Egyptian Orthodox Church. Some Egyptian Orthodox Church Christians are believers. Some are not. Depends on which area. The area that you see some of these families from is an area where the gospel really is preached. And I think that you will hear that in some of this testimony. So kill the lights and roll the tape. Welcome to this edition of Christian World News, everyone. I'm Wendy Griffith. Thanks for joining us. Well, imagine seeing your husband, brother, or father brutally killed by religious fanatics. That's what happened to many families when ISIS executed 21 Egyptian Christians in February. While the horrible video led to worldwide outrage, some families are happy that the martyrs kept their faith. And as Gary Lane found out, they're ready to forgive. I was very proud that my husband stood firm in his faith and that he didn't deny Jesus. That surprising reaction is happening 150 miles south of Cairo in the village of El Aour. Residents there honor the sacrifice of 21 Egyptians, brutally murdered last February by ISIS. Their pictures are prominently displayed in the sanctuary of Virgin Mary Church. Thirteen attended this church. The martyrs left behind family members, like 23-year-old Miriam Farhat. She became a widow when the militants beheaded her husband Malik Ibrahim in Libya. She first learned of his murder when she saw this now infamous video on local television. We were very sad for the first two days, but we hadn't seen the video. When we saw them in the video calling to Jesus, we were very comforted. And that's why Miriam and other families say they are now joyful, not sad. Babawi Alham's brother Samuel was among those killed. We were always praying that God would make them steadfast in their faith. We were very happy with what they said on the video, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. When we found out they had been killed for being Christian, we were very comforted because these were God's children and he took them. Although Samuel's wife and children now live without a husband and father, his family told CBN News their faith is stronger. They forgive the jihadists and even pray for ISIS. I pray for them that God may open their heart and they may know the truth and know that what they do is wrong and then do the right thing. Jesus told us to forgive every sin and we forgive them and we hope that they can come to know Jesus. Christians here in Egypt are encouraged to know they're not alone. Back in the United States, there's a growing movement among Christians there to demonstrate unity and solidarity with those who are suffering for Christ in the Middle East. And that would be us tonight. A union with those, a solidarity with those around the world who are literally being killed for faith in the Lord Jesus. I'm interested to know what were some of the things that struck you? What were some of the statements that were made in this video that right now that you're surprised that you just heard? Okay, that they're praying for them. That would be one. I can hear that. What else? They forgave them. They, they just openly, and this was, this was done shortly after that, that event occurred. What else? Any other things shocking? Nothing's too strong for Jesus. These, they're glad that their relatives are still alive. Yeah, okay, so that they stood strong for Jesus. Yeah, exactly. In fact, did you hear that they said, when we saw the video, we were so happy and relieved that they stood strong for Christ all the way to the end. Imagine if that was your husband that you saw someone take two of his fingers, stick it into his eye sockets, pull his head back, and slit his throat. As they cried out, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. You see, what would cause people to even cry out, Lord, forgive them, forgive them. Lord Jesus, have mercy upon them as they are being killed. You see, friends, we have a gospel that goes beyond 
anything and everything that this world can throw at us. We just looked at that Sunday morning when we studied Psalm 121, a salvation that goes beyond the troubles and the struggles of this earthly life. That promises eternity for all of Christ's followers and in him. Do you have your notebook? And if you would, take it and turn with me. I want you to notice tonight that there are Um, that there is a tremendous need for us to not abandon the gospel. And one of the ways that we don't abandon the gospel is to remain true, instead of remain true to the faith of Christ and not to the faiths of the world that are not in Christ. Um, It is amazing how many Christians don't follow the truth and wind up chasing either after the worldliness that is around them or after a cult or something along those lines. So the, uh, the title of the study of this particular one that we are doing for the next eight weeks is Cults and Counterfeit Gospels. We want to make sure that we are not deceived in, in believing, and we're going to talk more about what a cult is in the next few weeks. We're not going to do that tonight. We're going to be talking about what is the true gospel tonight. We, in order to be ready to deal with cults and the counterfeit gospels, we want to remember what is the true gospel. And um, tonight, I'm, I just, you know, many of you know that my birthday is, is right around the corner, and my mother-in-law sent me a hundred bucks. Um, isn't that cool? Um, I, I was really, really excited about that. I don't get to see many of these very often. Um, but I, I was thinking, you know, I kind of looked at it and I was like, you know, I wanted to taste it. See, is that really real? Is that the, is that the right one? You know, there's, there's in, this, in this world today, there's counterfeit that is really all around the world. How many of you have ever had a counterfeit bill that a store or a bank would not take? Did you ever have one? We're in South Florida, so I kind of think that they're, they're like printed in people's backyard here. Um, but... It's really interesting, everything that the government does in order to make sure that it's very, very hard to to make a copy of this, to to make a counterfeit. In fact, we have the Secret Service, and I I met somebody, one of the children coming to our school, his father works for the Secret Service, and we've had Secret Service agents in our church, and they are the ones that are in charge of dealing with currency and detecting counterfeit currency. But it's very interesting that when you have a $100 bill or a $50 bill or a $20 bill all the way down to a $1 bill, there are, there are numerous things that have been done to try to make it difficult to make it a, a counterfeit. But you can still make counterfeits. You can still think, have, have things that are very, very close to the real thing. And even with all that they do, do you know that they have watermarks on these things? If you hold it up, what looks like just a white hole there, you have light behind it. You see an image of George Washington, or you see an image of um, Abraham Lincoln, or one of those. And in fact, you can also hold it up, and you can see a, what is basically a band, a thread through that runs all the way through this bill that is woven into the linen of the paper that seeks to make it very, very hard to, to, to copy and to mimic that. There are other things that are on it that are keys and clues um, with the numbers and the letters that are on it to to seek to make it very difficult to serially make bills that are counterfeit. Even though that's the case, there are still counterfeits that look very close. When we come to studying the cults and the gospels that are around us that are diversions from the gospel of Christ, The greatest way for us to know and to see what those things are that are wrong is to know the real thing. The more we know the way the real thing feels, the more we know the way the real thing looks, the more we know and are familiar with the real thing, we will be able to detect when something comes our way that is not correct. That's true with paper money. That's true with coins. That's true with all kinds of art. That's true with all... The the more you know about that particular thing, the more you can see a counterfeit. And so it's very appropriate that as tonight, we we begin a study on cults and counterfeit gospels. It's very important and it's very appropriate for the next couple of weeks that we really look at what is the true gospel. Let's look at what the true gospel is so that we can be careful to know 
what the truth is. Notice with me on your outline there on page 7, the passage of Scripture, Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. A very, very important passage. I hope everybody has notes. If you don't have notes, um, lift your hand and the guys will get some to you. So if you don't have them, looks like everybody got it. Um, look what it says in Galatians 1, 6 through 9. Paul is writing and he writes to the Galatians. I am what? I am astonished that so quick that you are so quickly deserting whom, him who called you into the grace of Christ and are turning to a what? Ah, uh, they're turning away from the true gospel. Paul is saying, I'm shocked at how fast you're doing this. Not that there is another one. Can you underline that? Not that there is another one. You see, there's people who think that they have another one, but it's not really the gospel. It's, it's not that there's another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. He's saying that even if you see an angel come and he doesn't go with what we originally told you, don't believe. Look what it says. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. So that same statement is repeated again. When the Bible repeats things, it said, it's saying to us, this is very imp important, you need to give careful attention. So all around us, we, we have counterfeit gospels and counterfeit beliefs. Let's look at this and fill some of these in. There are some common myths. So these are myths. The myth is stated first. Look at the first myth on the screen. First myth is cults and counterfeit gospels are very small. That's not true. There are many very large cults and counterfeit gospels. There, there are many that are massive, involving hundreds of millions of people, even billions of people. Look at the next part. Cults and counterfeit gospels are normally isolated. Is that a myth? Are they normally isolated? No, they're not. They are extremely influential. There are certain cults and counterfeit gospels that are very powerful. Cults and counter we, we can often hear, cults and counterfeit gospels, gospels are clearly immoral. They live very immoral lives if they have a counterfeit gospel. Is that, is that true? Absolutely not. There are many cults and counterfeit gospels that live very moral lives. Would we like to name one or two of them? Okay, we immediately think of the Mormons. People are like, man, hire the Mormons. They'll never lie to you. They're squeaky clean. They'll be right on time. You know, they're, they're super good. I mean, you know, so when you kind of think about Mormons, there's a discipline that's infused into their belief system that is not immoral. It's very moral. Um, Islam likes to promote a, a moral view, uh, though that's another religion, um, and they would consider themselves very moral people in the outset, um, but we, we come to see that, no, on the, on the inside, it's still the flesh and, and very immoral. But look at the next part. Cult and counterfeit gospels are far from me. Is that true? No. I mean, some of you have either cult or a counterfeit gospel living under the same roof in your home. Um, or it's next door, or it's the people across the hall from where you live, or it's the people that work all around you. How about this one? the bottom of page seven, cults and counterfeit gospels are merely a matter of personal preference. If you just want to believe that, you can believe that, I can believe this, and we're all pretty close. Is that true? No. Cults and counterfeit gospels are ultimately a matter of eternal truth um, versus eternal falsehood. So here's our purposes over the next few weeks. Flip the page to page eight. We're going to move very fast. The clear purposes that we want during this secret church session of cults and counterfeit gospels is, number one, we want to believe the gospel in our lives. We want to believe the gospel. Look at John 3.16, and if you would, just underline each, each time it says believes, or the word belief in here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, underline that, believes in him, should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world may be saved through him. Here we go. Whoever 
believes in him is not condemned. You see, belief is important. Look at the next part. But whoever what? Does not believe in him is condemned already because he has not what? He has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. In the name of Jesus is Yeshua, which means Jehovah saves, Yahweh saves. So his very name shows what he does. He saves us from our sins. So the issue of believe is important. We want to believe the gospel. Number two, we want to guard the gospel in our churches. So we want to believe the gospel in our life, and we want to guard the gospel in our church. If we do not guard the gospel at Sheridan Hills, we will drift from the gospel. Young people, just mark it down. When you're coming along in life, all the time as we run, as we run through life, you, you will have to find a church that holds on to the gospel and guards the gospel because you will run into uh, churches and settings and campus ministries where, where they've watered down the gospel or they've sought to change the gospel or they've left key aspects of the gospel out. We want to be careful to guard the gospel. Look at the next part there. We want to spread the gospel. Christians are called to believe the gospel, guard the gospel, and spread the gospel as we continue through this life. Look at Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Circle that next word. Go. Go, therefore, and look at the next part, make disciples. So we are really called to go and make disciples. That's the key verb in that sentence. The key operative part of that is to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Good job. You're here tonight. You're learning. You're wanting to walk in the truth and hold on to the gospel, believe the gospel, guard the gospel. But also, as we come to know the gospel, we are called to share the gospel. So look up across the page. So those are our clear passage, our clear purposes. Look across the page. Here we come. Our main session for the next two weeks, tonight and next Wednesday night, is the, this title right here, The One True Gospel. The One True Gospel of what? The One True God. So you can't know about the counterfeits and you can't know about the cults if you're not clear about what the one true gospel is of the one true God. And um, this, is, this is very important. Now, I've underlined on the title screen here the, the one true gospel. Just put a big circle around that top phrase because that's what we're doing tonight, right out there to the side tonight. And uh, next week we'll be looking uh, at the doctrine behind the one true God. So Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, is one of these passages that really carries a, a really beautiful expression of what we really believe is the one true gospel. And notice where it starts off there in verse 1. It says, and you were what? Circle that. Dead. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in, whence, in which you once walked following the course of the world, through the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our what? Flesh. Just seeking to gratify all that you just want to do or not do, all of the things of this earthly life. The passions of the flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And we're by nature, underline it, children of wrath. That's who you were, he's saying, to the, to the Ephesian believers. You used to be dead. You were children of wrath. You were going and you were headed for wrath. Like the rest of mankind. Now circle these next two words. But God. But God. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together. Who made us alive? God. God did this through Jesus Christ. Made us alive together through Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ. He's saying, you have no idea what has been given to you. 
It's going to take you the ages to learn what was given to you when Jesus came and rescued you from being a child of wrath to being a child of God's grace. Look at the middle part there. It says, and this is not, excuse me, it says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God beforehand, prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, these simple phrases are so very, very clear, but there are so many people that they still are holding on to this, to this basic, common human mentality of works-based salvation thinking that somehow that if they're good enough, if they go to church enough, if they go to Sheridan Hills Baptist Church enough and sit through these long sermons and all of this stuff and they, we, they give their money and they change diapers in the nursery and they do all those things, somehow all of this God will smile upon me and eventually let the good outweigh the bad. But here we see that that is absolutely antithetical to the gospel. That is absolutely not what the gospel says. The gospel says that it is not as a result of works. It is the grace of God. Now, we're going to cover some things tonight that I think some of you, there's going to be some things clicked in the mechanics of the gospel and how God saves us and what Jesus does. I pray, I am, I am praying, but have been praying as we come up on this, that for some of you, you will finally and forever understand the gospel in a way that you never have before. Notice the green box that is here on the page. Here is a one big powerful sentence that describes what we mean when we say the gospel. Here it is. Fill this in or, or get ready to underline a couple things. First of all, the gospel, is, and it means, underline this, good news. The gospel is good news, is the good news that, on, that the only true God the just and gracious creator of the universe has looked upon helplessly, hopelessly sinful men and women and has sent his son, God in the flesh, to bear his wrath against sin through his, underline it, substitutionary death. Very key words. His substitutionary, that means he died in my place, on the cross, and to show his power over sin through, underline it, his resurrection, so his substitutionary death and his resurrection from the grave so that everyone who turns from their sin and themselves and trusts, circle the word trust, and trusts in Jesus alone as Savior and Lord will be reconciled to God for how long? Forever. Now this is good news. This is good news where he is saying God comes to rescue us. So let's look at the one true gospel. Just like my $100 bill that I showed you a few minutes ago has some threads that run all the way through that thing, and I wish you could see it. It's right here besides old Ben Franklin. Um, there's a thread. When I hold it up, I can just plainly see it right there, just plain as day. There's a thread that runs through this thing that is saying that this indeed is a true dollar bill. There are some threads that run all the way through the gospel. There are some important doctrines, some important ideas that run through the gospel, and I want us to look at five of them very quickly tonight. So gospel thread number one is this, the character of God. Circle the word character. This is the character of God. You see, the first thing that we need to understand is what this God is like and how he moves and what he does. First of all, bottom of page 9, God is the holy, just, and gracious creator of all things. Look at Genesis 1.1. Look at what it says. In fact, let's read Genesis 1.1. What does it say? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Those are the first words of the Bible. And so the first words of the Bible are saying to us the most unique nature of who God is. He is before the beginning. In the beginning, this means he was already there. He creates the heavens and the earth. Whammo, right there. There's no one else like him. He is the creator God. And so we start to see that in his character, he is holy. Holy means set apart, not like the rest, different. He is completely different than everything else. 
And so the first thing that we want to write in there at the bottom of page 9 is, God is holy. At the top of page 10, you see that he is perfectly unique. Do you see that at the top of page 10? He is perfectly unique, completely separate, and absolutely pure. This is important for us to have a grand view of God and how big and how different he is from the creation. And why is this? Because he is the creator. Look what it says in Isaiah 43, 15. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the creator of Israel, your king. There is no other one like this God. Look at the next part here. God, we said, is not only holy, but he is also just. You see, God justifies the innocent, and he condemns the guilty. Look what it says here in Proverbs 17, 15. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both like an abomination to the Lord. This is a God who is just look at the next one not only is he holy and just but he is also gracious and that's very good because if he wasn't gracious all of humanity would have no hope because he's a just god you see the just one says that he condemns the guilty and what we see in the scripture is everyone is guilty so we need a savior we share in the sin of adam we're going to see that in just a moment but because he's gracious there is hope for us. God shows the guilty, excuse me, God shows the guilty free and unmerited favor. That's what he does. He shows the guilty free and unmerited favor. He gives it to us freely. Titus 2.11, what we studied last year was this. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. That's why Jesus would say, go and preach the gospel to every nation. People from every tribe and every tongue and every nation. So the character of God is very important. But not only do we see the gospel thread of the character of God, we see the gospel thread of the sinfulness of man. Throughout the gospel truth of the Bible, Bible we see that mankind is sinful. Circle the word sinful man. See that first bullet point there? We are each created by God, but we are all corrupted by sin. Now, I've kind of outlined this um, on this. Notice this, Genesis 1 through, in Genesis chapter 1, 26 through 28, we see that God creates us, right? Creation. But in Genesis 3, what is so important in Genesis 3 in the Bible? Remember this? We've been studying, remember creation, fall, redemption, glory. We've always said Genesis 3, this is where Adam and Eve blow it. And us with them, because we are, we are inherited, inheritance of their sin. But notice Romans 5, verses 12 through 14, even clarifies it. And this is on the bottom of page 10. Look what it says. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses. Look what it says. Death reigned. From Adam to Moses, even those who were sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. We all share in the condemnation and in the death of Adam. So we are corrupted in our sin. Here's, I often illustrate it this way. Do you have to teach a child to do the wrong thing? He comes pre-wired, pre-conditioned, everything else to do what? To do the wrong thing from the get-go. He comes pre-wired to do the wrong thing. You have to teach a, a child to do the right thing. Turn on the news. This is pretty good evidence that all the way around the barn, we are sinful. The world is, is not getting better. The world is not healing itself spiritually. We see around us that we have a deep, innate sin problem. Look at the next part here. We have rebelled against God. So not only are we corrupted by sin, but very specifically, we, are, we have rebelled against God. And we see this throughout the Bible. Romans 3.23 makes it real clear. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does sin. Excuse me. No one does good. Not even one. There is none righteous. You see, we've all turned away from God to what? Underline that. To ourselves. We've turned away from God to ourselves. Romans 5 makes that, or Romans 8 makes that very clear. And this is manifested in self-indulgence, self-righteousness. Look at the next bullet point there. 
what we thought would excuse me what we thought would lead us to freedom has led each of us into slavery we think that that this sin is going to lead to freedom it's going to make things better but it actually leads us into bondage look at john 8 34 jesus answered them truly i truly i say to you everyone who practices sin is a what slave to sin and who is everyone who practices sin this is everyone Look at the next part here, without Christ, especially when we are still in slavery to sin. But look at the next part. Next bullet point. We are separated from God. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned, and here it is, fall short. You're not with God. You fall short of the glory of God. In Isaiah, God's word tells us that our sins have cut us off from God, and we are separated from him. Well, what are the effects of our sin, being separated from God? What are the effects? The first one there, circle it at the bottom of the page, is guilt. We have this guilty feeling that's there. Um, Not only is it guilt, but turn the page over there, shame. Fill that in. We have shame. We we feel the shame of our sin. We, We feel the condemnation, and we feel the embarrassment of our sin. We're not proud i mean i know some people are proud of sin sometimes but ultimately we we see this shame that came in as soon as adam and eve sinned they went and they hid themselves and they and it wasn't just about hiding their bodies it was it was about starting to hide from a holy god and hiding from his image and others and this is why we we don't typically go around bragging about our sin though some do and we we know there's aspects of that that we may do that but typically there is a shame that is part of our fallen time our fallen nature look at the next part not only shame but also fear fear is part of it and he said in genesis 3 10 i heard the sound of you in the garden and i was what i was afraid excuse me i was naked and i hid myself i was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. So fear, he, he has this, this realization that he's before a holy God without a, a covering for his sin. Look at the next bullet point there. We think it is relatively minor issue, our sin is a relatively minor issue, when actually it is an infinitely major problem. Some people think that their sin is no big deal. But what we see in the Bible, throughout the Bible, is that our sin is a massive deal. It is a massive problem before God. Look what it says in Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so this is, this is death. This is, this is total disaster, total cutoff. Look at the next part. We are dead without God. So it's not that just we're sick. No, we're already dead. Colossians 2, 13. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us of all our trespasses. So this trespassing against God causes us to be in a state of fatality, a state of death. Um, What we thought would lead to life has led us to death. And notice these two bullet points. What we thought would lead to life has led us to death, either eventual physical death, but certainly also eternal spiritual death. Both of those are coming. It's not only do you get to die now without Christ, but you will die for all of eternity, and you will be separated and cut off from a spiritual, from eternal spiritual life with God. Look at the next part. We are completely unable to save ourselves. This is another part of our fallen problem in the gospel. This thread that runs all the way through the gospel is that not only are we dead without God, but we cannot save ourselves. We we simply cannot redeem who we are. And so there's a third gospel thread, and it is not not only the the deadness of of our problem with sin, but let's look at this, the sufficiency of Christ. We are insufficient in ourselves. This is important for us to realize. We are insufficient in ourselves, but because of Christ and in Christ, we find total sufficiency in him. And we see this woven throughout the Bible, that Christ is sufficient to save people from their sins. Now, this is is all very important because cults start looking 
at the sufficiency within yourself. Cults come along and false gospels come along and they start to talk about, well, the real you, the inner you is actually not that bad and there's, there's parts of you. Or if you do these things and you do these things and you do these things and you don't do these things, then eventually you're going to find sufficiency. And what the Bible clearly says, all these points on page 12, the 11 and 12 are, you're insufficient, but Christ is sufficient. This is, here it is, and fill this in. Jesus alone is able to remove our sin and restore us to God. The Bible makes this very, very clear. Look what it says in 1 Timothy 2, 5, at the bottom of page 12. For there is one God, and there is one what? One mediator between God and men, and who is that mediator? Pope, John, Paul, the two, whatever. Is that what it says? No. It doesn't say Pastor Andrew Coleman. It doesn't say your grandmother or your great-great-grandfather who was a Baptist preacher. It doesn't say any of those things. What it says is there is one mediator between God and men, and it is the man, Christ Jesus. He and he alone. Top of page 13. Because, and why is this? It's because of who he is. Jesus is sufficient, and he alone is the one. And how is that? Because of who he is. His humanity. What we first see is his humble character. We see in Jesus what true love looks like. We see in Jesus what true godliness looks like. True godliness isn't bragging. True godliness isn't, isn't powerful and manipulating True, God, true godliness is not um, always being seated at the head of the line or, or at the head of the table and, and insisting all of these things. What we start to see is the heart of God is the one who, even though he created the whole world, he would come down and he would take a basin and he would take a towel and he would wash his disciples' feet. He would do the task of, and that was, that was a beautiful symbol it was an act of function, but it was a beautiful symbol of Jesus saying, there is nothing that I won't do in order to show you the humility of my love for you. And so, you know, it's, it's just very, very interesting to me how the world doesn't like a Jesus typically like that in many, many ways. The world wants a Jesus that's very powerful. That's what, that's what, the, that's what the Jews were looking for, was a powerful Messiah that would come and set them free in great power. And Jesus showed up riding on a donkey, humble, walking in the desert with a band of, of outcasts, with, with guys and gals of, of no acclaim and ill repute, and here he comes declaring to them in humility who he is. Look at the next part. Not only in his humanity that is humble, but in his deity. And here, his extravagant claims, his massive claims. Look what he says in John 6, 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. That is an outrageous, extravagant claim. And that's exactly what Jesus would say. Look at John 14, 6. Circle the whole thing, John 14, 6, where it says right there, Jesus said to them, to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Would you underline the last part of that? No one comes to the Father except through me. This is what we call the exclusivity of the gospel. This is what we call the, the grand difference between true Christianity and all of the all of all other beliefs and views. True Christianity says that Christ is the only hope and the only way. And it's not us saying it, it is God saying it in what he says. Flip the page and look with me. Not only because of who he is, that's what we've just looked at, he's humble God and he's extravagant God, um, but we also see it's because of what he has done. What has he done? Jesus lived the life we could not live, put out there to the side, perfect. He was perfect. He lived the life we could not live. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and then look what it says, and in him there is no sin. 
So this Jesus is sufficient because in him there is no sin. He was fully tempted by sin, and he fully triumphed over sin. He never sinned. He was the one who would be the perfect sacrifice. Look what it says in Hebrews 4.15. 4, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, and then underline it, yet without sin. So Jesus understands, he knows, he sees, he, he has experienced all that mankind has ever been tempted with. He has been tempted in every respect as we are, yet without sin. So this brings us to the fact that, notice that bullet point there, he is perfect man. He is God alone able to substitute for human sin. This alone is the one who can substitute for human sin because he's perfect. But yet he's also perfect God. He alone is able to satisfy God's divine judgment or the divine judgment of God. So it's because of what he has done. What has he done? He's lived the life we couldn't live, and now you fill it in. Jesus died the death that we deserve to to die. Jesus went to the cross in a way that, that I deserve and every other person in the world deserves, even though he did not deserve to do that. He was the only one that should have escaped this death. But yet he died willingly, laying down his life for those who were his friends. Look what it says in 1 Peter 2 and verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. So how is it that our sin is forgiven? It's by his death in our place. And I I think that this is beautiful right here that David has written here, and I want you to see this. The essence of sin, this is where man substitutes himself for God. This is the essence of sin. We, We seek to be God. We substitute ourselves for God. We 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 think that highly of ourselves. But notice this: the essence of salvation is when God substitutes himself for man. This is amazing that God would do this, that he would come and he would substitute himself on the cross where we deserve to die. He comes and dies in our place. Why would he do this? Only because of his love. Look at the quote at the very bottom, page 14. At the cross, there's three words here. At the cross, God expresses his judgment upon sin. You see, God's judgment is not muted It's not put on pause. It is not removed. The picture is God's judgment is wrathfully poured out. And we see this at the cross. But notice this. He expresses his judgment upon sin. He endures his judgment against sin. So it's God who comes and expresses judgment against our sin. And yet he's also the one that endures it. God, we see pouring out his condemnation upon himself in Christ. Notice the next part here, the third one. In all of this, at the cross, he enables salvation for sinners because he takes the judgment for them. So this is enabling salvation for sinners. So, top of page 15, Jesus conquered the enemy we cannot conquer. And it was the enemy of sin and death. Jesus comes, and he is the victorious conqueror. Look what it says in Revelation 1.18. The living one, I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And look what it says, underline this, and I have the keys of death in Hades. You see, he, he is the one who owns the condemnation. He is Lord over life and death. That bullet point. Look at the next one. He is Lord over sin and Satan. You can go read that in Colossians 2.13. He is Lord over you and me. Whether you recognize it or not, He is Lord to the glory of the Father. Turn the page. Notice with me. Gospel thread number four. Also, we see throughout the gospel, we see the necessity of faith. God is always calling his people to believe in him. That is not a New Testament idea. We see it through the Old Testament. 
In fact, we see that Abraham went out not knowing where he was going. He was simply obeying God. And so we start to see that it was by faith that God works through all the characters of the Old Testament that he's working. And then we see that that faith that was kept continually pointing to them to God and that they were expressing in God that God comes and brings that faith through to the New Testament through the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is, he is giving us the faith that we need, that this can only come from God. Notice this. We can be respo- restored to God only through faith in Jesus. Look what it says in Ephesians 2, 8, right below that. For by grace you have been saved through what? Faith. Circle that, faith. For by grace you have been served through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. You see, you're placing your faith not in yourself, but you're placing your faith in what God has done. Now, what does this really mean, that we are restored through faith? We can be restored to God. Notice this. The first one here is we can be acquitted before God the judge. What does it mean to be acquitted? It means to cancel out the charge of guilt, to cancel it out, to say that there is no longer a charge of guilt against us. We see this in Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The guilty charge has been removed from our account. Look at the next part here. We can be adopted, not just acquitted, but we can be adopted by God the Father. He will remove our shame. You see, we're no longer a son of wrath and a son of sin and a son of shame. We are now the son of the Most High God. We're the son of the creator of all things. Look at Romans 8, 14 through 17. It says, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received received the spirit, underline it, the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. So who is our Father that we're crying out to? This is to God. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are what? Underline it. Children of God, not children of the devil, not children of the world, not children of our own sin, but we are children of God. If children, then heirs, and if heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Now, I can't read those last two lines there where it says, provided that we suffer in him, with him in order that we may be also glorified with him without thinking of the video that we just saw with the guys in the orange jumpsuits. The family was relieved that they would continue with Christ and not deny their faith. You know, we, we have people around the world right now that can be released from priven, prison, be released from the, the judgments that are against them if they will just deny Christ, if they will just simply give up their Christian faith and say that they won't do that anymore, that they won't believe, believe that anymore, that they won't preach that anymore. And so we see throughout all of history, in, from the New Testament history, history, we see that there has been a calling to shut men and women up who are proclaiming the gospel. And we see Peter and John simply say, I'm sorry, but this name, we cannot stop speaking in this name. This is the one that we will continue to preach, and they continue to preach the gospel, even when the world is trying to shut them up. So not only are we acquitted before God the judge and adopted by God the Father, but now we're assured by God the King. So the King assures us, and he assures us that in this he overcomes our fear. We read this passage Sunday morning, Romans 8, 38 through 39, one of the greatest statements of promise in all of the Bible. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any else, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, the king has spoken, and the king has promised, and he assures us that we are safe in him. We are completely secure. Psalm 121. Look at the next part here. Not only can we be restored to God, but it's only through faith that we are restored to God. That's the next part of this phrase. Only through faith are we restored. 
and Jesus being the basis of our salvation. He is the basis, not ourselves, not our works. Faith is the means of this salvation. This is the vehicle that we get in and ride in, in the truth of God. This is the means. This is how it happens. How do you have God's grace except that you trust him in it? You believe that he promised, that what he promised is true. God is glorified when we believe him. In Hebrews chapter 11, it says, without faith, it is what? It's impossible to please him. You cannot please God without faith. So that which is not faith is not pleasing to God. That's in your, in your personal life, that's in your schoolwork, that's in your work life, that's for us as a church, that's for me as a pastor, that's for all of us serving in, in our lives and with our families. God has called us to live lives of faith. And whatever's not of faith is not pleasing to him and is actually dishonoring to him. So the only hope that we have in salvation in order to be saved is to place our trust in the vehicle that he has given us, that is faith unto Christ. Look at the next part here on top of page 17. Works are the evidence of this salvation. This is an important statement. Your good works, works in Christ, are evidence. They are not the means. Faith is the means. Works is simply the proof. Put above that, the proof, above evidence. Put above the word proof, fruit. The result, any of these that you can say, works are the evidence or the fruit or the proof of our salvation. Without good works, it indicates that we do not know the Lord. We turn from our sin and ourselves. This is the first great good work that God does in us in bringing about this is that we turn away from our sin. This is part of our volition, but it's, it's this beautiful picture of obedience that God calls us to hear what he's saying and to turn in faith to him. Look what it says in Mark chapter 1 and verse 15. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Circle it. Repent and believe the gospel. The word repent is very important. Jesus' first word and call to us to respond to the gospel is to turn to him, to repent of our sins. There are some people that say, well, you know, there's, there's, all you have to do is believe. There's, there's, nothing about, there's nothing about the reality of repentance in your life that you cannot turn without God doing that. And I just say to you, the first command is, is that God is calling you to turn to him and believe. And the evidence that we are God's children is that we will turn to him and believe. Those who are not his children do not turn to him and believe. But we come and we see this call to turn to him. There's some people that say, I believe, but there's no evidence that they ever turned. I would say that that makes very clearly that that is evidence that they have never truly believed. Notice part here. We confess our sinfulness. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Christians need to understand clearly that part of coming to God in repentance is confession of sin. Not only confession of sin, but also we die in our selfishness. We di- excuse me, we die to our selfishness. So no longer are we living for self, but we are living for beyond ourself. We are living as unto God. Look at the next bullet point. We trust in Jesus, our Savior and Lord. And so we turn from our sin and we trust in Jesus. We turn from our sin, that's the one at the top, we trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord. Look at Romans 10, 9. We used to sing this back in the 70s. But if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Romans 10, 9 is a favorite verse of mine. Anybody remember that? Anybody remember that? That was an old chorus that we used to sing. And then it would talk about this idea of the fact that we confess. This is how you come to know God. That you, you confess him as Lord. And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And look what it says. You will be saved. We believe in Jesus as the Savior who died for us. We submit to Jesus as the Lord who rules over us. Circle those two words, Savior and Lord. Whenever you hear someone talk about, is Jesus your Savior and Lord, or is he Lord and Savior, here's the picture that you're saying that he is the Savior who died for me. 
and he's the Lord who's my boss. He's the Lord who rules over me. He is my master and my king. So, bottom of page 17. An initial moment of faith in time leads to inevitable growth in faith over time. So you get this idea. An initial moment of faith in time, this is coming to God in salvation, leads to an undeniable, inevitable growth in faith over time. Here's the idea. If you come to Christ, you're going to grow in Him. If you've truly come to Christ, you will grow in Him. If you do not grow in Him, the idea is you've never really come to Him. Now, we see the Apostle Paul rebuking Christians that are babes in Christ. They're, they're, and so we see that there's a great rebuke. And it, and it is possible to be a baby, baby Christian that's, that's simply very, very immature. But we see a rebuke in that, that, that Christians are called to go on and grow in him. I remember hearing um, someone here in the life of this church about 30, 35 years ago said, well, you know... Um, I like Sheridan Hills, but I'm really not growing anymore. I'm not really being challenged in my faith anymore. And uh, if I was just really being fed, I would grow better. And another member of Sheridan Hills looked at that person and said, well, why don't you get out of the high chair and feed yourself? (laughs) And part of the idea was that, you know, we can even, even in in gospel teaching and gospel preaching we can come somewhat resistant to the preached word of god and we can we can or we can become rather insatiable or rather um rather so so um close to to what god is doing around us that we don't embrace his word that is preached and and come listening one of my mentors tom elliff Um, would often preach this to the people of his church in Oklahoma. He would say, you know, if you'll just come, and if you'll come and say, Lord, speak to me, God will speak to you every single time. If you'll come on Sunday morning, if you'll come on Wednesday night, and if you'll just come and say, Lord, speak, he'll speak. If you ask him to do that. And it, it may not even be from the preacher. It may be, but it may not be. It may be from the songs that we sing. It may be from a prayer that is prayed. Listen to this. It may be from your brother or your sister in Christ sitting down next to you and talking to you about their life. God speaks to us when we come to the assembly together. It's interesting that in Hebrews it says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together that you may encourage one another it doesn't even list out preaching singing and praying it says that you may encourage one another now the greatest way of being encouraged is to preach the gospel and to sing the gospel and to pray together that's true but here we see the fellowship life of the church in hebrews the big go to church verse is in hebrews that simply says do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together that you may encourage one another and find help so here we, we see this beautiful picture of growth in Christ. Look at the two verses that are there at the bottom of page 17. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image of one degree of glory to another. So we're, being, we're growing, transformed into the same image of one degree to the glory of another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. God brings our growth. In Philippians 2 is the idea that, that when God has begun a good work in us, he is going to continue that work, and he's going to continue to play it out into our lives. We see that from Philippians 1. And we come into Philippians 2. Therefore, my beloved brethren, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work. For his good pleasure. So he saves us to grow us to be faithful in him. Now we're about finished. Page 18 and 19. I want you to see this. The final gospel thread that we look at tonight is the urgency of eternity. You will see this throughout the Bible 
that eternity is coming. Eternity is coming. This is an urgent issue. Where you are with God and whether or not you are God's is an urgent matter that affects all of eternity. Look at the first bullet point here. Our eternal destiny hinges on our response to Jesus. Our eternal destiny hinges on what we do with Christ. Romans chapter 10, verse 28. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And so we are called to look at the one who not only can con condemn us, but who can also save us. So the first part that we see here is hell is a dreadful reality for all who turn from Jesus. All who deny and turn away and do not believe and who resist faith in Christ. Look what it says. A place of continual rebellion, final separation, and eternal dura of, of eternal duration. Jesus believed in hell. Paul believed in hell. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 7 through 8. But when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of what? Underline that statement. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Hell is a dreadful reality for all who turn away from Christ. But look at the other side that is possible in Christ. Heaven is a glorious reality for those who trust in Jesus. A place of full reconciliation, complete resurrection, an ultimate reunion. It says in Philippians 3.20, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So the urgent reality of eternity is either heaven or hell. And so the question is, will you turn from Jesus or will you turn to Jesus? The first one is this, will you turn from Jesus? You see, if you turn from Jesus, you look at these two bullet points, you live without Christ now and you die without Christ forever. Revelation 20 is this incredible picture of the reality of hell. There's, there's people in this day and time and there's, there's people who claim to be evangelical Christians and they're not really evangelical Christians if they deny the reality of hell. People, people sometimes will come to certain passages and certain realities and listen to this, threads of the gospel, threads that are part of the gospel, and just because they don't like the idea of that, they just say, I don't believe that. Thomas Jefferson, one of our great founding fathers, was one of those guys. I like Thomas Jefferson in many, many ways. He was a brilliant man. And there was a lot of things that he understood that we would do well to understand today. But he would take his scissors out and just start cutting through the New Testament. I have seen the Bible that he did this with. He pieced together his own Bible, removing the words of Jesus that he didn't like. My friends, that simply is not our option. In fact, the Bible warns us with great words of warning about removing and ignoring and picking and choosing smorgasbord Christianity and theology. It is an inconvenient truth that Jesus, Jesus profoundly proclaimed the reality of hell. And we see it as a thread throughout the Bible. Um, not only do we ask ourselves, will you turn from Jesus, but will you turn in Jesus? Will you turn in Jesus or turn to Jesus? I'm sorry, I'm saying turn. Trust, thank you. Will you trust in Jesus? Thank you. Look what it says. You die with Christ now and you live with Christ forever. This is why some people are disinterested in the gospel. They don't want to die 
to self now with Christ. But just recognize this, if you're one of the people that are struggling with that, recognize this, that Jesus, the one who did not deserve to die, went ahead and died in your place. He died your death. And so what he's calling you to do is nothing like what he did. This picture is so far beyond the, sacri- the, the great sacrifice that Christ has made for you is so far beyond what he's calling you to do. This is a good deal. Don't miss out on a good deal. Don't miss out on the greatest deal of all time. The greatest deal of all time is simply come and die to sin and self. Look to Christ and allow him to redeem you from your sin. Why in the world would you live without Christ now and die without Christ forever in hell when he's saying you can die with him now and live with him forever? Look at Revelation 21, verses 1 through 4, right on your outline. I want you to see this. John is writing, this is the end of the book, right toward the end of the book of Revelation, and he's he's recording the vision that he saw. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. So this this is the things to come. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. This is so awesome. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, and neither shall there be mourning or crying nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. You see, this is what it means to live with Christ forever. Mrs. Louise Riley, who we buried last Saturday, she is living with Christ in his manifest presence, in his real presence, in his visible presence at this very moment. How I wish I could see what Louise is seeing. And all of the saints that have gone before us. You see, we're just called by faith to believe in what we cannot see based upon the promises that a good and gracious God has made. This is the basic truth of the gospel. The greatest deal ever offered to a human being. Better than anything else that has ever been given as a possibility is the glorious, true gospel of Christ. And so my question to you tonight is, after such a clear picture of what the gospel is, have you turned in faith to Christ? I would hate to present this tonight and not have us bow our heads and give you, all of you who have never truly believed upon Christ, the opportunity to say, I'm not sure I ever understood that before, but tonight it seems like I do, and I sense God leading me to repent of my sins and to place my faith once and for all in Jesus. Dear friends, you can grow up in church all your life and go to hell. You can grow up your church, grow up in church all your life and hear the gospel, hear the gospel, hear the gospel, and never receive the true gospel of Christ, saying, Lord King Jesus, Come and be my Lord and Savior. Forgive me, Lord, for running from you. Forgive me for doing my own thing. Forgive me for doing all that has been against you in my heart, the smallest to the grandest. Lord, come and have mercy upon me in faith in Jesus. This is what it means to come to Christ in repentance and to turn in him in belief, saying that you and you alone are the sole way to heaven. This is your design, God. And I receive you now. Let's pray together.